from the team that brought you Spoof Ads Design Competition and Pelicola Film Fellowship. Here comes a new, exciting, and timely media literacy contest for students and youth groups. Hashtag Iwas Fake Digital Campaign Challenge on Countering Disinformation. Are you part of a campus press, student council, SK, or any youth organization? Do you have a novel idea for a counter disinformation campaign? Get a chance to meet like-minded individuals and orgs and get trained by experts in media literacy and advocacy campaign. Develop your group's potential and let your voices be amplified. Just design and launch a month-long digital campaign that answers the question, how will you address this information in your community? You might just win 20,000 pesos, 15,000 pesos, or 10,000 pesos, respectively. Isn't that awesome? Head on to ootvmedialiteracy.org slash iwasfake slash challenge to read the full mechanics. Form your team and register today! Hashtag iwasfake is developed by Out of the Box Media Literacy Initiative with the support of the U.S. Embassy in Manila and TechCap Taipei. Press, Student Council, SK, or any youth organization. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for choosing to spend your Saturday afternoon with us. I am Marla Nombrado, one of the co-founders of Out of the Box Media Literacy Initiative, or OOTB. This is Breaking Barriers, our year opener webinar on overcoming the many barriers to countering disinformation. So let me start off with greeting everyone, everyone on Facebook today and those who are joining us via Zoom, a happy, happy new year. You know? It's only been a little over a week since we welcomed 2021, but a lot of things have happened already. You know? A lot of things, uh, a lot of big, big news have captured our attention over the last couple of days locally and globally. You know? And this only shows how 
uh, we don't really choose any specific timing when to talk about important matters such as disinformation. So for those of you who are just tuning in today, I believe many of our registrants are still trying to get in our Zoom account, uh, but it's unfortunate that you weren't able to get in first. Um, but the good thing is you can always just tune in via Facebook Live. So we are being heard right now via Facebook. So if you would want to participate by asking questions or sharing your ideas, you can definitely do so through the comment. Right, through the comment section of our Facebook Live today. And of course, for those of you who are joining us via Facebook, or sorry, via Zoom, uh, welcome everyone. And um, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. So this afternoon, we are joined by two experts in the field of psychology and technology to help us um, get better when it comes to our understanding and knowledge of this disinformation dilemma that we are all facing. So we have back-to-back -back talks on the topics of psychology of fake news and the role of technology in disinformation. Aside from these two exciting talks, we will also be featuring, we will be putting a spotlight on some of our favorite counter disinformation campaigns that's the SML project from Xavier University in Cagayan de Oro, Tama Rao, an anti-infodemic campaign in Far Eastern University, and also Internews' initiative for media freedom. We'll be hearing more about these campaigns later on. So if you are not really aware about what EWAS Fake and what Digital Campaign Challenge is about, this is one of our most recent projects in Out of the Box Media Literacy Initiative. It's actually a media literacy contest for youths and students who want to create digital campaigns against this information. So if you haven't registered yet, you have five days left. Five days left to register your teams. Uh, just go to tinyurl.com, T-I-N-Y dot U-R-L, sorry, T-I-N-Y-U-R-L dot com slash EWAS Fake Challenge to register your teams and join the Digital Campaign Challenge. So without further ado, I guess we can now start with our first talk. Um, I'm very excited to hear from our first speaker who will be talking about the psychology behind fake news and why it seems that our brains as if are wired to fall for this information. Our first speaker is an instructor at the Department of Psychology in the University of the Philippines, Diliman. It's also in this same institution where he graduated summa cum laude back in 2016 with a degree in Bachelor of Arts in Psychology. Currently, he is taking his PhD in Social Psychology minor in Philippine Psychology. His research interests, take note of this, are in cyber psychology, digital politics, collective action, and civic engagement. So all of these topics that we are very, very interested to learn about today. So without further ado, I can now turn you over to our first speaker to talk about the psychology of fake news. Let me turn you over to Mr. Francis Simon Bryce. Well, hello everyone. Um, hello. Hi, Marlon. sir Simon. Good afternoon. Hello everyone. Good afternoon. Okay. So happy New Year, everyone. But despite the New Year, we're still encountering the same challenges. So I am happy to be here with you, okay, to talk about this very interesting topic. And I hope that we would all, well, at the end of the session, learn more. Perhaps not only in participating through the digital campaign challenge that the OTB is. Uh, doing right now, but also in our own capacities as citizens to be more literate in how we consume and distribute media for ourselves. Yeah. All right, Sir Francis, go ahead and share your screen. Okay, wait for a while. I hope the share screen is now okay. Okay. So I entitled this 
this talk as pain-driven fiction for the simple fact that sometimes in our current media ecology, it's sometimes more difficult to discern fact from fiction. And sometimes in the times that we live in, the truth is sometimes danger indeed than fiction or lies completely. So for this one, we're going to talk about what are the different biases and you know what are the different characteristics of human cognition that influences why we fall for fake news and what can we do to protect ourselves against it. Okay. So by the way, just a side note, for more information about this talk, you can visit the link down there, osf.io slash xv3f7 for more information. Yes, uh, there are a lot of things that we would want to talk about, but given the amount of time, I leave the rest as an exercise of the reader. Just kidding. Right. Why is fake news an important issue for us to discuss? The main reason for that is I think this, this quote from an article released just last year, the end of last year, encapsulates why it is important. In the words of Anastasia Kozirev, uh, they said that another challenge presented by online environments and social networks is the increasing speed and scope of false information proliferation and its resulting threat to the rationality and civility of public discourse and ultimately to the very functioning of democratic societies. The democracy, the political system like the one in which we live in, relies on people... Uh, sorry? Okay. Uh, A democracy, like the one that we live in, relies on people being able to discern truth from fiction. It relies on our ability to be able to discern truth from fiction, one. And number two, it relies on our ability to be able to talk about social issues in a proper manner. The problem is that the infodemic that you're encountering right now is somewhat sacrificing our ability to distinguish between these things. And so we're unable to talk about things formally and properly. Okay? So that's why fake news is important. Disinformation in general is important. And that's why we're all here today. A general principle before we begin with the biases of human cognition is why do we fall for fake news? How does our brain work? For the longest time, we want to assume that humans are perfectly rational, objective. We rely on facts. We take the time to deliberate, to think about things. We call this the systematic information processing pathway. It's deliberative, intentional, and effortful. The problem is that it relies on a lot of energy. Okay. For example, the last time, you know, the last time that you decided what to eat, did you ask yourself, um, how many calories are involved? What's the nutritional value? Ilang percent ang ating daily calorific need na nasasatisfy na pagkain na ito? We don't have the time to process all of that information all the time. And so we tend to follow the heuristic information, information processing pathway. The heuristic pathway is quick, automatic, and efficient. It relies on shortcuts. But the problem is that because it relies on shortcuts, it can be incomplete it can be skewed and it could be problematic in the conclusions that we arrive with. For you to be able to engage in systematic processing, you need the motivation and the ability to do so. We don't always have the motivation and we don't always have the ability to do so. If you were to fact check every single social media post on your feed, you would run out of energy doing so. Nakakapagod mag-scroll for your social media feed. And so, we tend to follow the heuristic pathway. And that is where the biases come in. It is through the heuristic pathway that all of the problems we encounter about fake news propagation begin. So the first question that we have to ask is, why do we fall for fake news? There are many studies conducted in this insight and other affiliated social science fields, but for our purposes, we're going to look at a few key ones. Just to clarify though, you know, and daming terms are related to this issue, misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. Okay. So we have all of these many terms. And typically the difference between them is, are people intentionally sharing false information? If you were fooled somewhat to share information, misinformation. 
if it's intended to be fabricated and to produce a particular narrative, it becomes disinformation and malinformation. So, but in our real world ecology, it's sometimes difficult to distinguish between intentional and unintentional. So generally we just call them false information. And if they masquerade in the form of legitimate news, we call them fake news. So this is just to clarify bakit ang dami mga issue natin may encounter down the line. Okay. For, our, for the simplicity of things, I group our biases in terms of these five categories. Information relies on our ability to process information. Research talked about how we look at the information presented to us. Emotion shows how our feelings and motivations can shape how we well, trust, deliberate, and process information. Relation shows that how we process knowledge and the information in use also depends on the relationships we have with other people. And production, or how our ability to filter fake from real, is also dependent on the ecology or the systems in place in our society. Word of warning, for those of you who would like to participate in the challenge and then you would try to target different aspects of human cognition, these five are arranged based on difficulty. Information is the easiest level to target, easiest to correct. Production is the most difficult. So we would go through the levels of difficulty from easier to adjust to almost impossible. But I hope that you don't lose hope in the process of us talking about this. Okay. The first two issues of information in cognitive processing is the fact that sometimes the only reason why people believe in fake news is the simple fact that it's always there. The interesting thing about fake news is because of continued influence, even if you already correct misinformation, people will still retain that false information and it will continue to influence their behaviors. Misinformation, once it's already inside your head, is almost impossible to forget. And even if you correct it with a debunking, a fact-checking, that false information is still somewhere in the person's brain. And the only thing that you can do is to repeat and repeat and repeat the fact that it is incorrect and hope that people will lose confidence in the misinformation they first received. Illusory truth is another issue. Repetition legitimizes. The more that you repeat information, the more that people will believe it. Okay? Illusory to this problematic because fake news in our social media sites relies on the fact that people will keep on sharing the same false information. And by the time that a fact checker comes in, it's already too late because it's already done its damage. Okay. Illusory effects, illusory tooth effects are problematic because the more familiar you are, the easier it has become, the easier it is that you are able to retrieve a particular piece of information. Okay. For example, if I were ask you, if I ask you the question, ano ang capital city ng Pilipinas? What is the capital city of the Philippines? It would be very easy for you to remember because it's familiar and you're able to fluently or easily process and remember that information. Compare that if I were to ask you, okay, what is the 15th element of the periodic table of elements? It will be difficult for you to remember because you're not familiar. If both of those pieces of information are already fact-based and it's already quite difficult to remember the periodic table, how much more is it difficult to remember true information when you're confronted with the same false information again and again and again? The final reason why, well, correct information, the truth is difficult to defend is because of the overkill backfire. Sometimes, because fake news is presented in quite a simple and quite an attention-grabbing manner, it's more difficult to correct because the truth is sometimes more complex and more difficult to understand than lies. You would notice that fake news typically presents things in a very clear cut, A led to B, B led to C, tapos ang usapan. However, we will notice that the truth has many nuances, it has many side notes, it has many footnotes, and that's what makes it problematic. If we want to correct misinformation, we need to find a way to make the truth more accessible, easier to understand, and easier for people to process. Otherwise, we're fighting an uphill battle, and fake news will always find its way to continuous influence on people. So information, you will notice, 
people don't have any intention to believe in fake news. They just happen to do so because they're exposed to do so. The next set of issues on perception is more difficult because in this particular case, people are motivated to hold on to their beliefs. If the information biases are simply because people are exposed to it, in perception, people hold on to, inf to the fake news, to disinformation, because their entire perspective of the world relies on it. Naivealism shows that people assume that their perspective is rational and objective and the perspective of other people is unfair. An example of this is there was an ex experiment that they did where they showed people supporting a football team or actually basketball, whatever sport, and then they watched the same clip. They found that regardless if the referee voted in their favor or against their favor, they would always say that it was always biased because they found that what if the referee did not make a judgment that is consistent with their beliefs, it's always biased. Even if when in the real world, the clip itself was neutral, objective, and nonpartisan. So the very fact that something does not conform to your beliefs may already trigger reactions for you to say, I fake news, yeah, I biased yan. This is linked to confirmation bias, the fact that people tend to, tend to pay attention more to information that confirms already what they believe. And the reason is that when your deepest held beliefs are not confirmed, medyo masakit sa feeling. You, you believe in the first place that what you think is true, and the fact that it, is, it has been well, offset, it has been confronted, already makes you feel, I was wrong all along. And the fact is that people don't want to feel the feeling of being wrong and the feeling of their self-esteem being crushed because of information that we believe was actually incorrect. The final thing is that because of cognitive closure, we try to seek information that gives us some sense of certainty and clarity. The problem is that the truth does not always give clear-cut answer answers. The truth does not always give us very detailed clear guides on what to do as opposed to fake news, which tends to target specifically those blanks in our ability to understand. One of the reasons, for example, for why COVID-19 related disinformation, for example, um, different treatments or different medicines, which are actually not cures for COVID-19, the reason why people share this is that we live in a very uncertain time. We are very afraid of harm, of death, of sickness. And so these fake news are actually able to close that uncertainty in our cognitions because they give us some level of clarity and control over our circumstances. Compare that to the truth that we don't know when the pandemic will end. We don't know if the vaccine will be anytime soon. We don't know if these vaccines will be completely safe for everyone. And so medical professionals and scientific communicators are also having problems about making people accept the fact that life is uncertain and we have to accept the fact that well, we would have to make some guesswork down the line. Now we are entering into more problematic territory. The first two, information and perception, can be corrected just by making people think about the problems of their own cognitions. Everything from here on will be attacking motivational aspects. It may sound cliched, but the heart is more difficult to persuade than the brain. The brain will listen to facts, to objective information with a systematic pathway, but emotion and everything else follows the heuristic pathway, the, inten the unintentional, the intuitive pathway. Fake news, you will notice, tends to be related to anger, fear, disgust, anxiety, negative emotions. That is because we tend to remember negative things in our life better than positive things. And we also found that actually news items, whether true or false, are actually shared even more when they cause feelings such as anger or fear. And that's the reason also why people tend to be angry on social media. It's that it's easier to feed off of anger of people as opposed to positive emotions like hope, joy, and satisfaction. Another layer you will notice is that following from an earlier notion of simplicity, overkill backfire, fake news tends to be presented in a very clickbaity, memorable fashion. We are able to capture the attention of people because it's interesting, it's new, it's sensationalized, it's scam baiting. But the point is that we tend to pay attention to fake news because it presents things in a very interesting, 
and probably entertaining manner. We used to think that, oh, you know, uh, we should forget our emotions when we talk about things, when we process our factual information. We tend to say that we should not be emotional when we make decisions. The problem is that as humans, our emotions are fundamentally part of how we think about information and news. We call this motivated reasoning. Motivated reasoning refers to how our emotions and motivations actually guide how we process information. For example, the reason why you are told never to make a promise when you are happy is the fact that when you are happy, you tend to be optimistic. When you are optimistic, you tend to judge that things will be okay, things will not fall apart, things will keep on going as they are, and so you judge, will you overjudge the ability for you to succeed in a particular promise. And that is also the reason why you're told never shout at someone else when you're angry. It's the fact that you tend to be more pessimistic, negative when you're angry or sad, and that's why you're able to underestimate the good that other people have because your emotions and motivations already shape how you understand and process information. Perhaps the most important thing here is the worldview backer effect. We tend to look at the world through the lenses of our ideologies, of our beliefs, okay? Ideologies, beliefs can be political, they can be religious, they can be anything. And that these beliefs shape fundamentally how we think people and the world works. For example, if your worldview is that the world is dangerous, just people cannot be tested, then you will act in a way that confirms to that worldview. You will be more distrustful. People tend to be more scheming and manipulative of others because they believe that they will be manipulated in the first place. Compare that to the worldview that people can be trusted, people can be optimistic, and then you will treat others with the same level of respect and civility. Okay? So worldviews are important because this is the fundamental lens through which we see everything. And the reason why we are mentioning it here under emotions is that worldviews are very emotional in content. It's difficult to shatter a worldview because when you shatter the worldview, you are literally saying to the person, everything that you believe in your life is incorrect. So that's not a really fun emotion to have. So far, we've been looking at people as individual agents when actually we live in a world with social others. Because of intergroup biases, we tend to like people who are or in our own in-group, and we hate people who are outside our in-group. That's why you will notice palaging may mga bangayan na, ikaw ay miyembo ng katong partido, you are a member of this party, that's an intergroup bias. The fact that you are saying that we are not in the same level, we are not in the same category, already shuts off communication lines to bridge to the other person, to the other, from the other camp. Another layer of this is psychological reactance. Psychological reactance shows us that we resist persuasion, we resist being corrected because we don't like our feeling of freedom being violated. That's why when we correct misinformation, we have to do so in a way that's quite respectful and not authoritative if we can use the term. You will notice that it's not effective to just say you're wrong, you're stupid, you're wrong. Because that is... That will be a short trigger for psychological reactance. Again, people don't like the feeling of being incorrect, of their self-esteem being shattered. And so the best way to correct misinformation is, in, is, if possible, in a way that is civil, that encourages discussion and conversation. Otherwise, the actors will come in and the person will just shut you off. Perhaps the most common term that we've been hearing from these past days is ideological polarization. This links with intergroup biases. It's the fact that we divide our world based on political lines. We dislike the out group. We prefer our own in group and we automatically say yes to the policies of the people of the parties or political groups that we support. What we notice with the relation category of biases is that what makes fake news and disinformation difficult is that people will not readily listen to persons from, person from outside the group, even if that group might have the truth or the proper information or the news that is necessary for that particular issue or cause. All of these four are somewhat still under control. We can communicate with people across out groups. We can talk with people. Okay? We can bridge the gap. The final issue 
is that in production, these are the things that you no longer have control over. <clears throat> in framing, fake news can be framed or actually any piece of information can be framed in a way that selectively emphasizes some aspects of an issue. So even if the information is true, it can be presented in a way that is problematic. Or if a information is false, it can be presented in a way that makes it feel as if it is true. Disinformation networks also show us that in the Philippines, we do have a lot of agents who work to actively coordinate fake news production and to distract people from real social issues. Finally, because of social media algorithms, a lot of cases, accuracy and information are not exactly the priorities. Sometimes user engagement is prioritized in these algorithms. And so you will notice that echo chambers occur where you tend to be exposed to information that already confirms to your own beliefs. So we moved from very easy to understand information effects to more problematic emotions and motivations to potentially unsurmountable production issues. But we shouldn't lose hope. We can speak power into truth in the time when truth is already losing some of its power. And each of these domains or sources of bias can be addressed in somewhat different ways. The first one is that fact checking is difficult to do. Fact checking relies on people to deliberately check across references, to slowly read materials, to slowly read references. But the problem is that not everyone has the time to do so. In fast and frugal fact checking, we give people very heuristic ways of checking whether the information they have is probably trustable or not. Wala tayong time na mag-fact check na kailan sinabi ni politician A itong issue na ito. We don't have time to do that. But what we can give them is a very frugal, a very quick way of checking is the source reliable or not. In this particular framework, for example, they just ask who said the information is there evidence? Do other sources say the same thing? To compare, okay, for example, this is a comic by, I think this was the comic by Tarantado Calvo. That's the name of the artist with the Foundation for Media Alternatives. It's an interesting Facebook comic. Go check it out. Enough two comic panels. It's how we can do fact checking or at least source credibility checking for ourselves in a very quick manner. You will notice that, for example, in this comic panel, he's presenting information not in a way that is complex, like the ones we've been doing a while ago. Ito approach yung ginagawa ko sa inyo, medyo mas academic pa siya. But this one, this comic strip presents how we can fact check information in a more engaging way. People tend to pay attention, remember attention capture, to things that are a little bit interesting. And I believe that we know web comics are quite interesting. So this is one way to present information in a more credible, but at the same time, interesting manner. If you have more time, for example, the very first fact check process, you will notice has a lot of steps. If you have the time and if you have the resources, so this, is some, this is actually the absolute goal that you want to do to fact check everything. But in the absence of the time, the resources and the people to do so, at least we can practice fast and frugal heuristics. For perception, we have to also practice intellectual humility. As the people who believe in a particular thing, we need to acknowledge that we can have biases that shape our perspectives of the world. We have limitations on, that, on what we can judge us to, and we have to admit that we have the ability to change. At the same time, we also have to believe that of the people that we are convincing to adopt more truthful knowledge of the world. We have to admit that we are not the harbingers, we are not the bearers of truth. We have to admit that we have limited abilities to think about things, and so we have to be humble in how we approach and how we talk with others. Perhaps one of the characteristics we also want to develop is the need for cognition. Thinking about false information and the truth does require a lot of cognitive effort, but we can, well, strive to do means of slowly building up this ability to be more accurate in how we think about things. In terms of emotion, we also learn how to practice deliberate ignorance. Deliberate ignorance sounds like a bad thing because we say ignorance is not a good thing. Deliberate ignorance simply means knowing when to disengage from a particular issue. 
alam ko mahilig tayo mag doom scrolling. You scroll through your social media feeds, you look for information, you lose hope about the possibility of change. When in fact, you can learn to disengage, to shut off your social media sites once in a while, and to learn when it's best for you to participate in the discourse. Know when it is the best time for you to talk. Know when it is not a few, it is not a good cause for you to fight for. Learn to fight your battles, but always never lose sight of the end, which is to promote a more integ, a more integral and a more truthful media landscape. Okay. I know that you want to be able to bring out the truth to the world, but sometimes you also have to learn to fight which battles are the most important for you to fight in. In relationships, I know that it is difficult, but the best solution to crossing the political democratic divide is deep canvassing. Deep canvassing is a method that is used in political research where people will try to persuade the others into joining their campaign by slowly discussing with that person. The best way to confront worldview effects, emotion effects, is to slow down and talk with other people slowly. The only way that you'll be able to actually engage with them is when you do so with an open mind and in a good faith fashion. Kaya hindi effective ang method ito on social media because on social media, people can log off. This is a very demanding thing to do, but that's why you would only do it with people that you know would be receptive to the conversation. And you should know when to disengage, again, deliberate ignorance, when you know that the other person is just providing false information or polarizing the environment in a way that is actually in bad faith. So we don't have any intention for change or any intention for change. Finally, the issue about production is something that we cannot solve on our own, but it is something that we can solve together. The things that OOTB, Out of the Box, is doing is what we would call under media literacy, which is teaching people how to become more critical in how they use media and how they process information. One of the skills, for example, that fact checkers use is what we call lateral reading, which is reading across multiple sources, checking source A versus source B versus source C. You would notice it's quite a complex process. That's because media literacy is also very cognitively demanding. Yeah? And that's why media literacy requires a lot of need for cognition, your ability to slow down and think about the issues that are confronting you. Again, the issue of fake news and disinformation, especially in the Philippines, is not something that we can solve individually. It is something that we would have to solve together. And that's why the most important component for solving the production side of false information is advocacy and activism. Fundamentally, we need some level of institutional and technological change about how algorithms on social media can be more responsive to truth, okay? and on how we can change our culture to be more responsive and more supportive of the value of truth, freedom, and accuracy in information. Okay? So activism can involve any particular stuff such as volunteering for media or literacy organizations, okay? participating in disinformation drives. All of these are forms of advocacy and activism, and we can all do something, even in our small ways, to solve the infodemic especially during the precarious times of the current COVID-19 pandemic. So you will notice we had a lot of biases and we had a lot of solutions. Gano ba kahirap solution na yung problema na fake news? Hopefully, medyo clear yung sagot na yes, gano siya kahirap. The reason for that is, okay, closing this presentation, we have a lot of issues to confront. We have a lot of levels to resolve. Okay? And there are a lot of ways in which we can understand what which we can do. For example, one recommendation is if you're interested about how fake news is propagated so that you will understand how it can be corrected, there are actually a lot of online games that demonstrate the strategies used and disinformation networks so that you will understand the workings and machineries behind them. For example, getbadnews.com and goviralgame.com will show you some of the strategies that disinformation networks use to propagate fake news on social media, okay? But fundamentally, our ultimate goal in disinformation campaigns is how can we create a news ecosystem and culture that values and promotes truth? Disinformation is the broadest face of the issue. It will include things such as fake news, scientific projectionism, histor historical revisionism, 
all of these things rely on the fact that people are actively attacking what it means for something to be true, what it means for information to be accurate. And so our challenge okay, as citizens and you perhaps as participants in the digital campaign challenge is how can we create these information campaigns that makes people think critically about the information and how can we create a culture that values and promotes accuracy in how we discuss information online, okay? A lacking project na, okay? but when I believe the youth are capable of anything they set in their minds into, okay? So with that, thank you for listening to this talk and I hope that you'll be able to take this information to seek the two for area go. Ayan. Hi, Sir Francis. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, paano ba natin i-describe yung presentation na yun, Sir Francis? Sobrang dami ko natutunan. I hope you guys also brought with you a notebook and a pen while <laughs> listening to Sir Francis's um, talk or siguro mas fitting na tawagin natin yung kanyang presentation as a as a lecture, no? Um, kasi ang dami ko talaga natutunan. Um, I was able to pick up um, a lot of new things when it comes to understanding how our brains work and how not only our brains, but even our hearts. No? Uh, favorite ko na part na dinescuss niya was um, the, uh, our reliance on our emotions when it comes to decision making. No? Um, information consumption is a large part about decision making no meron siyang metaphor uh when he started his presentation metaphor um uh, about having breakfast no kapag tayo ay nag-aagahan uh we don't really think so much we don't really go through the systematic information pathway uh in that hindi naman talaga natin pinag-iisipan ah ganitong karami yung nutrients na aking um ma intake or ma-consume when I have this particular meal instead of another meal. The same thing goes when we go online. No? A lot of the things that we do online when we are um, going through our feeds, ay hindi naman natin pinapadaan doon sa systematic information pathway. Instead, we go through the heuristic information processing pathway na, again, mas mabilisan at mas ginagamitan natin ng emotion and other cognitive shortcuts. And so it's very important. Again, the number one thing that we have to take note of um, Sir Bry's presentation is to be aware of these um, psychological vulnerabilities. No? Yung awareness natin ng psychological awareness. vulnerabilities na yun, it can really go a long way. Kasi kapag alam na natin na um, maaaring hindi natin matandaan yung mga academic terms na binanggit ni, ni Sir Simon, but the idea of it, if we are aware of them, then, again, doon natin mapapagana yung slow thinking na sinasabi. Yung mas mabagal na way of processing information, which is what is needed right now when it comes to dealing with this information. At this point, um, we would love to get questions. No, We would love to take in some questions for Sir Francis. Um, whether that is via Zoom or via Facebook, just go comment uh, them, you know, place them in the chat function here in Zoom or in Facebook. Pakilagay dun sa ating um, comment section. No? And then we will read them uh, to Sir Francis so he can get his insights. Um, sige, let's start with this question from Sir pa Paolo Ordonio. Uh, I think Sir Francis is still with us. No? Sir Francis, yes. maybe I can request you to unshare your screen. Okay. So we can, we can um, share the... Yeah, okay. Perfect. Sige. So from Sir Paolo, uh, Miguel Ordonia, seven, yeah? Um, relative to emotional biases, how can we regain our digital identity when you've been cancelled out by the social media world? So, for example, no, okay, natin sa context ng isang PBB housemate who supposedly supported the ABS-CBN shutdown 
and then um, uh, he already apologized. No? He already apologized to social media citizens. However, he was cancelled already. No? So, um, is there a way though, but to regain our digital identity, especially if you are? Lagay na lang natin sa context na if you have been misinformed, for example, or if you've shared false news before. To the process, ko to kasi, actually, this is an entirely new different ballpark. In, na, when I say different ballpark, just a precedent, isang mahabang issue din to in cyber psychology. What are the ethics of um, call out and how does it transform into cyberbullying? But to provide a short answer for this one, regaining digital identity, babalik tayo sa issue ng deliberate ignorance. Deliberate ignorance, again, is learning when to disengage and learning when the conversation is no longer productive. The issue that I found with the PBB eviction um, circus, etc., is that some people were willing to engage in systematic processing to slow down and criticize na Sana natutunan mo na hindi productive yung ginawa mong pag-support doon sa pag-shutdown ng ABS-CBN. Na there are actually people who I've seen na ang approach nila is, if we can educate this person, kasi parang yung tao naman meron siyang opportunity, meron siyang desire to actually understand the issue. Okay? Na hopefully, uh, if we would know the person better, talaga sana meron siyang legitimate uh, or sincere form of atonement or desire to learn more about the issue. The problem is that how we talk about it on social media is not always productive. Ang dami niyo makikita usually, di ba, ang reply nila is mga memes, mga gifs, mga tangential responses. In that particular case, we also have to learn intellectual humility on our part, when to retract our statements, when to stop participating in the bonfire, when to stop adding fuel into this entire mess of an issue. Ang dami din kasing case, for example, I don't want to mention the specific call out culture-specific instances kasi ang dami na nila. But the point is, as users, as onlookers on the particular issue, our role in our digital identity is, on one on our part, being able to determine when it is productive for us to participate in the discussion. In the same way that we could call out people for problematic statements, it's, I think, also our duty to call out our fellow call-outers, if we can call out, if we can call that them, na Hello, this is already stepping out of line. Um, hello, hindi na yata ito nakakatulong. Hello, fact check muna ito kasi feeling ko hindi ito nakakatulong doon sa current issue. Okay. So, there are a lot of cases in the we have seen where kaya naman nagalit yung mga tao in a particular issue. It's not because of the issue itself, but because of false information that also surrounded that particular issue. So, in that particular case, babalik tayo sa... Madali mag-tweet, madali mag-post sa Facebook, paki-fact-check muna. Hindi ibig sabihin na nakalagay inquire tapos may picture ng tao, ibig sabihin totoo na yan. So please fact-check the quote first before you react. Hindi niyo dahil akong bakit at some time Twitter would prompt you, nabasa mo na ba yung article bago ka mag-comment, bago mo siya i-retweet. Hindi niyo dahil akong bakit kapag sa Facebook we would indicate how long it takes for you to read. They're already nudging you na, please pakibasa muna yung article bago kayo mag react So that's how one way that we can do. Okay? Learn to disengage. If not disengage, and at least also participate in calling other people for stepping out of line when calling other people out. Medyo meta siya, but I hope that sort of answers the question. Mm -hmm. I actually like how you, what, what you mentioned about calling out yung mga call-outers. In a way, this is uh, you speaking to your in-group. I think I read in an article before that it's it's more effective if um, people in the same in-group are the ones calling out each other. Kasi meron ngang resistance eh, if it's coming from um, your out-group. No? Kapag kinokorek ka ng someone na you don't identify with, iba ang political identity niya, there's a tendency for you to resist the correction. But if it's someone from the same camp, um, mas madaling tanggapin. So the same thing goes for um, call-out culture and misinformation. No? And again, if, if we're talking about recent events, uh, we, we saw some opinion leaders, celebrities who, um, ano ba, who 
admitted that they got misinformed due to the recent issue with uh, Christine De Serra, no? And um, I think it's really a way for them to also, um, yun sinasabi ni Sir Francis about intellectual humility, admitting to your mistakes, and it's again talking to your own tribe, no? Talking to your own tribe na. Um, we got to fix this, at least even within our tribe. Uh, may comment ka ba doon, Sir Francis? I like how you put it, Marlo. Na, yun nga yung point na, um, as well, people in this particular issue, we also have our responsibility towards our in-group. Kasi minsan, hindi talaga sila makikinig from outside. So at least talk within your own group. Mm -mm. Okay. I'm sure meron pang ibang questions yung ating participants, but at this point, we are going to uh, ask you to park those questions first. We will be um, asking Sir Francis those questions later if we still have more time. Uh, again, thank you very much for our first presenter. That's uh, Sir Simon Bryce from the Department of Psychology in UP Diliman. At this point, we are going to watch a video, a quick video presentation from the team of... Um, team of Tama Rao and the Infodemic Campaign at FEU. So let's watch this video. Tama Rao, the anti-infodemic campaign of FEU was launched in 2018 by Russell Fami, an alumna and a recipient of FEU's Outstanding Communication Student. This campaign was created with the goal to cultivate a more critically thinking community and a platform to combat the proliferation of fake news in our society. Tama Rao aims to inform students on strategies to detect and fight propaganda, disinformation, and made-up news. It also educates on where these misinformation thrive and essentially how it becomes a threat to democratic discourse. Our Facebook page is a place for FEU educators who support digital wellness to share information and campaigns that add on the global fight against infodemic. More so, the majority of the content posted on the page are the works of AB communication students of Far Eastern University, like myself, who are enrolled in courses that tackle infodemic as one of our modules. From myths versus facts about COVID-19, online quizzes on the main arguments of the SOGI bill, to bingo games on media literacy, and many more. To talk in detail about the latter, I, along with my group mates, created Bingo. Be informed on news and info literacy guidelines and observations. I know, a mouthful, but Bingo. It's an anti-fake news addition to the Bingo trend that emerged on social media. This fun and interactive game consists of media literacy habits in which one would encircle if they follow the practice when consuming news online. This edutainment aims to help people assess whether they are perceptive to the news they encounter on the internet and also spread awareness on the proper way to distinguish legitimate information from fake news. Another great campaign example is hashtag Isiping Mabuti, an infographic created by a group of third-year communication students about misconceptions on sex. Here's Erin to discuss their campaign further. In 2019, Pornhub released data that showed the Philippines to be one of the top 10 countries to view and visit their website despite us being a conservative and religious country. This begs the question of why do we consume everything sexual from pornography to the act itself but portray talking about it as taboo. Hence why we created hashtag Isiping Mabuti, a social media campaign that aims to address and debunk these sexual myths to open up the discussion about it, and lastly, to raise this awareness to the youths. In order to accomplish our desired goals for the campaign, we first sought out information from students of Far Eastern University, where we asked about what are their long-standing beliefs towards sex and some myths that they could still be using up until this day. That was what we used as a starting point for what we should be researching about in validated websites and journals in order that we could start debunking these myths. As communication students, we are passionate in ultimately helping diminish the circulation of fake news. 
we picked sex education as a topic since the lack of formal discussion um, regarding so still persists up until this day in the country. Although it may not dramatically change the overall way of how we communicate sex, of how we talk about it, we still hope that it serves its purpose to be one step closer in breaking the myths that still persists in the Philippines. So again, we'd like to thank the team of Tamara for um, sending in the video recording to share with our listeners today uh, their project called Tamarao, an anti-infodemic campaign. Again, Tamarao is organized by students from Far Eastern University. And uh, we see a lot of these different efforts, these different campaigns and projects organized all over the Philippines um, to particularly target their own communities on specific issues that are relevant to them. And this is the same um, motivation that we have for organizing the Iwas Fake Digital Campaign Challenge. How else can we motivate and inspire young people and students to come up with their own efforts to battle disinformation challenges in their own communities, right? So later on, we'll be hearing more from our other um, notable uh, campaign projects. That's the SML Project and Initiative for Media Freedom. Uh, for now, we are going to move to our second talk this time on the role of technology in the spread of disinformation. To share with us um, her presentation on this topic, we have multimedia journalist for Rappler.com who focuses on media, disinformation, and democracy. She was an awardee of the Fulbright Hubert Humphrey Fellowship in 2019 and also a graduate of the Master of Arts in Journalism at the Ateneo de Manila University. So I'm very excited to introduce to you our second speaker for our webinar today. Let's all welcome Ms. Camille Elemia. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Let me just share my screen with you. Yeah, hold on. Oh. Marlon, can we just use the? Sure, sure. Ah, uh, okay. Get a copy. Or one more. Let me one. Okay. Let me just try one more time. What? Okay, in the back of you, or do you want no, to? No, uh, okay. yeah, just okay. See, good, see, good. All right, let's hear. Yeah. Hi everyone. Again, I'm Camille Alemia. I'm Rappler's multimedia reporter assigned to cover media, disinformation, technology, and democracy. Um, but before that, I've been a political reporter for almost a decade, but Rappler decided, because Rappler has been focusing on this topic for like since 2016, and they decided to assign a reporter solely on that. So that's why I had to change my designation or my beat. I'm here to talk to you about the role of technology in spreading this information. Um, maganda yung sinabi ni Francis about the psychological aspect to why we are prone to accepting fake news or to becoming victims of fake news. But for my um, presentation, I'd like to discuss more about some technical aspects about um, what the problems are in terms of these platforms. Next. Um, that's what that's what they say, like uh, sinasabi nila, especially with technology, if the product is free, then most likely they're selling you. Because, for example, in the case of uh, in the case of the we call this the social media companies, because the main business model nila is uh, wait. Sorry, I cannot see my 
Are you, uh, Marlon, are you showing it? Yes, yes. Okay, see. Yeah. So um, that's what they're saying. If it's free, they're selling you. Because um, for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, nagtataka kayo. Um, it's there. We can use them all for free, but multi-billion companies itong mga to. So how are they able to get or earn so much money from free use? And that's because they're selling our whole user experience in their app and in their websites. So that's what we call um surveillance capitalism. A uh, uh, technology expert named Shoshana Zuboff coined that term. Basically, what it means is that um, the, the companies use uh, and modify our behaviors to sell them to their advertisers. And kasi, I'll discuss more on this later, but the bis main business model of all these tech companies is to get more advertisers in their platform and for them to be able to sell that, dapat mas marami rin silang users on their platform. That's one of the problems that really contribute to the easy spread of fake news on their platforms and online. Next, just to give a brief background, um, before the internet, I remember when I was still in college around early 2000s or mid 2000s, para everyone was, wow, internet, it, makes our life so much easier. It's so easy to research for our thesis. It's so easy to connect to people, family, friends abroad. We don't have to pay long distance fees and all that. And actually it was really a good thing. In fact, the first picture here, it's a photo of the Arab Spring. It was through social media that the people in, it started in the country of Tunisia. And because of that, they were able to start a revolution in the Middle East. And of course it really connected the second photo shows how everyone was able, almost everyone was able to connect to people easily because of the technology and all that. But while that was the case before, now it seems like social media is breaking us apart in more ways than one. And now we have problems with disinformation, misinformation, as what Francis earlier told us about. And um, and that's the problem. And later I will try to delve more into what are the specific problems inherent to these platforms that really make the problem difficult for us. Not just for us journalists trying to fight everyday disinformation, but also for you, like users, students, and everyone online. Just to give a brief background, para makita lang yung difference about the different how different it was before pagdating sa information ecosystem. Uh, before traditional, I mean, now, until now, traditional TV still dominates news media. But before, I don't know if you all remember it, but I hope many of us still do. Na, if you really want to know more about what's happening in your country or in your place, you have to wait for 6 p.m. or sometimes 9.30 p.m. to watch TV Patrol, to watch 24 Horas and Saksi or Bandila at that time. But now that's no longer the case. But while TV still dominates news media here, primarily because of, syempre, hindi naman lahat, hindi naman mabilis ang internet connection everywhere in the country, marami pa rin, I think around 60% based on some uh, Reuters data, 60% of Filipinos access information online. And that's uh, because uh, meron na ring rise ng smartphones kasi marami na ring murang mga smartphones now. So majority of people who use social media for um, getting news and all that, you access it via smartphones. So ano yan, kasama yan sa isang, uh, pag, when we talk about social media platforms, kasama rin like yung Apple, yung Huawei, yung mga ganyan in the ecosystem of how we access our news and information. Next slide. Media was the gatekeeper of truth and information before, but now, as can be seen in this next slide, the internet has also allowed for this in, for the spread of disinformation. This photo shows, uh, yung, like we at Rappler, especially me, I we really come across daily deliberate actions to spread this information and misinformation. So what they do is they hide behind their computers and then their role really is to 
deliberately spread or type wrong information or sometimes not really wrong but misleading or sometimes kagaya ng nasabi ni Francis Karina oversimplified truths na ang daling for users ang dali nilang maabsorb yon and then the more widespread they do this the bigger the network they get and the more difficult it is to point or to address it so now next slide why this information spreads like wildfire online number one as i said earlier this is really important it's the advertising model of these platforms they really get their money by selling out by selling us not us directly but what they know about us they want us to stay longer on their platforms. That's why, kasi syempre, kung they want that space to be filled every time. So that's why, like sa social, uh, sa Facebook, for example, yung news feed, di ba parang you can, you can, parang you can just go on and on hours trying to, to check information. And also there's an algorithm to that. They make it interesting for you based on what they think they know about you based on your likes, based on your comments, and sometimes they insert some random thing to break the monotony so that you don't get bored and keep on scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. So the more users and the longer the time the user is spent on the platform, the more money for Facebook. And some whistleblowers from Facebook and Twitter already said that they really cannot track all of its advertisers, which could be really dangerous. I'll show you an example later of what information they have on us. And sometimes you'll question, do they know, do they think they know us more than we know ourselves? And I'd like, with this kind, because it's an advertising model, na to, they really do micro-targeting, like, uh, kung anong, like per person as much as possible, they, they uh, design their messaging or the way they they portray the ads kung ano yung tingin nila depending on your age on on your school on your group of friends things like that and this brings me to the next slide the cambridge analytica i don't know if everyone's familiar with that but uh, this this was a big issue i think 2 to 3 years ago at cambridge analytica is a uk based company naging malaking issue sila because um it was found out that they used Facebook data to create behavioral examples of voters in the U.S. So based on the data available on Facebook, they got it. And gumawa sila ng, ng in, like each person, like for example, they think I'm like this, uh, I'm a journalist, I'm, I'm a woman. So inisip nila, this is how we should portray our message. This is the way we should design our message to attract this person in order for him or for me to vote Donald Trump. So it's kind of scary like that. And it's also available, I mean, Cambridge Analytica did the same thing in the UK for the Brexit and also in Malaysia. And also they were involved in the Philippines. Um, I don't, I won't discuss that much further, but I can give you the links to Rappler's stories on that. But this isn't a proof that even Filipinos are affected by that, even if uh, ang na-prioritize or ang nabalita sa mundo ay yung role nila sa Brexit in UK. This is a data from this is the data from Facebook itself. So Filipinos are the second nationality na yung mga Facebook information uh, was improperly shared with Cambridge Analytica uh, back in I think 2016, 2017. And Chris Wiley, a whistleblower, a former a former executive of, or a former staff of Cambridge Analytica even told uh, Maria Ressa and us in Rappler that uh, at that time, they viewed the Philippines as a Petri dish. So they could really experiment on us, not, I mean, on our uh, social media habits because Filipinos are the top social media users in the world. And at the same time, there's lack of regulation here. So yun yung nangyari. And next slide, I'll show you. This is what this is just an example of what Facebook data, what Facebook has about us. Ito pinili ko lang like other categories. You can just go like when you go to your profile, just type add preferences slash add underscore settings, and then there are different options there. So I chose other categories. Pero meron din dyan based on your interests, based on other information about you. So dito. 
other categories just because I was born this month, parang pwede nila kong ma-target doon for maybe mga birthday ads nila. And then they they made me, they categorized me as a commuter and then an engaged shopper. I don't know exactly what that means, but that's the thing with Facebook. They can just, based on what they know about you, they can just group you into whatever group they'd like you to put in. And then because I'm an... I'm a Facebook page admin and because I use MacBook. So that's even yung ganon alam nila. And also here in the second photo, I don't know if you can see it, but I'll just read it out. It says, to show you relevant ad ads, we use data that advertisers and other partners provide to us about your activity on their website and apps. So this includes offline interactions and also off Facebook activity. So sometimes, I'm sure napapansin din ng iba sa inyo, may i-google kayo or may titignan kayong site just to think if, parang just to browse dun sa stuff nila or whatever. And then susundan kayo sa Facebook and Twitter. So that's an effect of micro-targeting. And it's it's dangerous na ito, itong mga data na meron sila about us, it's dangerous if mapunta to sa ibang tao na hindi maganda yung intention. And that's what happened with Cambridge Analytica. And especially with the 2022 elections coming, we need to be extra careful with that. Another tip is if meron kayo sa Facebook nakita nyo na they targeted you, you can just scroll sa upper right and see the ad information to know why they chose to target you. Uh, why they chose to target you. Next reason, next slide, for the proliferation of disinformation is somehow Francis touched on this already. It's the algorithm. The problem with algorithm is that. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and many other social media platforms online, they really are not transparent about their decision processes. So in general, Facebook says they prioritize meaningful interactions for engagement because the higher engagement, the more parang activity on the platform, maraming taong mas pupunta, so mas mabenta for advertisers. And for Twitter, it's the trending, the hashtag, uh, to show the best content to the most people and for Instagram, like that, similar to that. Pero ang thing dito is hindi nila sinasabi. So somehow or sometimes tomorrow they can change the algorithm in an instant and para ang lumalabas, we're at their mercy. And algorithm also here includes yung sa news feed kasi like uh, sinasabi nila like with, a many, so, uh, with a many, many Facebook and Twitter staff and former employees that I talked to na Yun nga, they, they show you the contents they think you'd like to see based on your interactions. So uh, if, you're, if, you, if you keep on liking dog photos or cat photos, they give you that. Pero every now and then, they give a break just to, alam yun, hindi ka mapagod. So really, their goal is growth no matter the cost. I mean, I'm not here to totally demonize them, but the point is, Internet, Facebook, social media is really good, really helps us, especially like, diba, for disaster, uh, disaster response and all that. But more than that, we shouldn't let them get away just because they can do that. Because a Facebook is a whole world of its own, and Twitter also. Like Facebook, I think, has more than 2 billion, um, 2 billion users, and that's more than China. Next is polarization. So this is in connection to uh, to algorithm because also polar is another feature of Facebook and even Twitter and YouTube and Instagram, uh, yung friend of a friend feature. And usually, I'd like to link this to what Francis mentioned earlier, na yung meron tayong, um, what do you call that, uh, yung parang in-grouping, is that the right term? Basta yung parang we have affinity to people who think, who we think, think and behave like us. So para ang nangyayari, it's, kasi sa real world, diba, you're faced with uh, like sa classrooms or even sa family, you're faced with people na possibly may contrang view than what you have. Pero with Facebook, that's really the goal. Kasi if they think you'll interact more with people na kagaya mo, they'd push that. And it's, it's dangerous because people will now have parang less patience over contravening views and it's not healthy and also it produces echo chamber and people separated into tribes and also I think another factor to this is yung groups of Facebook because groups mostly hindi naman yan na monitor 
so especially for private groups and that's why we have uh, that's why we have parang nawawala ng shared sense of meaning and shared sense of truth kasi like that's why we have um flat earthers meron tayong qanon supporters meron tayong iba't ibang groups and this information really spread, spreads faster in those kinds of environment na closed walang nagche-check wala no one can counter it so that's the problem all these three are perfect combination for this information but i'd like to talk more about para mas aware kayo kasi my goal sana is for you to prepare for the campaign kasi now that we're in a pandemic mas malulunod tayo sa disinformation especially um, when it comes to po politics so now ang strategy nila is to get smaller influencers closed groups kagaya nung just to an, an example of smaller influencers um before i i don't know if you're familiar with thinking pinoy before the whole 2016 thing hindi naman siya ganyan kalaki but they tapped him and now is already so big na kilalang kilala na siya but with that naghahanap sila ng mga smaller influencers and not necessarily these smaller influencers yung kilala um, sometimes it's a facebook page producing funny quotes funny jokes or, or sometimes interesting memes or entertaining stories so ang warning lang na if you see on your feed something funny or something interesting for you don't just immediately share it or follow that page you have to look into um yung kagaya nga nung present kanina na parang cartoon or comic strip na tignan mo the about section of that page and you also have to check on the transparency history because sometimes for example merong mga hugot quotes jan merong mga jokes tapos ngayon yun lang ang post nila pero come next year half or half of this year later this year makikita mo yung iba diyan nag change na into a into a fan page of a politician so dapat careful doon you have to regularly check and sa transparency page minsan makikita mo na 2016 this is a fan page let's say of Ann Curtis and then 2017 or mali 2014 it's a fan page of Ann Curtis and then 2016 during the campaign it suddenly became a Rodrigo Duterte fan group so ganun yung mga styles nila ngayon and the more na mas nagiging uh, mautak sila the more it will be differ difficult for us to catch them so sometimes we also have to be ahead of the game like dapat maliit pa lang yung nakikita mong patterns like kayo as users of facebook you can already see that you don't have to be like a journalist or a tech expert or something like that to know that parang mapansin niyo lang and then just email it to verifiles to rappler or to anyone else na tingin niyo um, can look into that further because honestly no single person or no single company can fight this alone we're all in this together as cliche as it may sound but that's how difficult it was or it is and then just to give an example of how this thing works para may concrete example tayo next slide i'll show you this story about it's called twin mark that's the name of the company so just a brief background about twin mark um in 2019 uh facebook took them down because it's not just fake yung nilalabas nilang information but the whole network in which they operate in is inauthentic so they create websites dito lalabas yung kunwari uh yung kanina pinakita let's say philippine daily inquirer.ph or philippineinquirer.net so parang iibahin nila yung websites or urls para to make it appear as if it's inquirer or things like that and sometimes gagawa pa sila ng iba't ibang um urls to make it look interesting to viewers para madaling i-click and then those contents they will share it on i'll show I'll show you later. I have a, an example. Uh, they'll share it via their own Facebook pages. So they also create fake Facebook pages, meaning it's not organic. The main goal really is to increase engagement. Tapos, on top of that, for example, Twinmark owns a series or a group of Facebook pages. And on top of that, they also pay other um, social media influencers and also other yung mga funny funny pages akala nyo harmless yon pero these people are earning 
from your eyeballs, from your interactions, or from your views. And some uh, Rappler is currently working on this story, but we have proof that some celebrities and social media users, like known people, have been paid by this network to share these questionable information. Right now, this network, ano sila, down sila 2019, January 2019. But Rappler, this story talks about how just a few weeks after they were taken down, they were back on track online. So it just goes to show how Facebook is really unable to police its own ranks or to police its own world. Kasi nga, it's really a big, it's really a big place. And they if they don't exert more effort and if they don't put more people like human to detect it, not just automated, it's gonna be difficult. And next slide, I'll show you some examples of their inauthentic movements. So we discussed about uh, yung usually and topics nila, diba? funny, entertaining, or sometimes uh, mga, it depends on the time. Eh. My times na they, their posts are against uh, perceived critics of the government. But for this example, it's usually clickbait articles, sila, like what Francis mentioned. And this one, they shared the same post from the same site with, ex with the exact same caption. So when you click on it, um, sometimes I click on it para makita ko anong laman. Wala talaga siyang laman. It's like, alam mo yon, just to get engagement. Kasi when you click on their website, they also earn from Google because they are subscribed to Google Ads. Yun yung ano nila, parang eh, naglalagay sila ng ads. If people click on their sites and people see those ads, it's money for them too. So another one is this. Um, a fan a fan page for Sura Ramirez, the celebrity, and then two others. So ito, same caption, same time, same date, same source. And they're really, para ang ginagawa nila kadalasan, uh, kasi this is against, this is a post against my colleague, Pia Ranada, the Malacan, uh, our Malacanang reporter. And they really try to, para ang pinipili talaga nilang pictures, yung mga awkward, tapos, Iha hype nila yung issue about ito, Willie Revillame and Pia Ranada. And then, ikakalat nila yan. Tatlo lang yung kinuha ko, pero uh, all at the same time, within one hour or 30 minutes difference, sabay-sabay sila nag-post. And this is also Twinmark. And the thing with Twinmark, I keep on saying Twinmark, but really, hindi lang Twinmark yung ganitong network sa Philippines. Na they can fake engagement so that they can get your attention. And on the other hand, on one hand, they earn from you as well. And then another one celebrity topic na naman about Sharon Coneta, it's the same people. So you see yung isang Facebook page in the middle, it's Angelica Panganiban, Who Got Lions. Who Got lang talaga yung pinopost niya, pero every now and then, may inject yung political story or, or a story against uh, perceived critics of the administration. Now, they're... Most of their stories are entertainment, but what's to stop them from using uh, malapit na yung campaign? Eh? What's to stop them from using uh, using this network, this massive network, to push propaganda? Just look at the uh, like. I just want to show you how vast their network is. So, nung na take down yung this is from September one to November 30, 2020, just last year. Pero nung na take down yan in 2019, maybe just three or four dots lang. So the green circles are Facebook pages, yung mga sinabi ko Angelica Hugot Line, Sura Mirez fan pages, and all that. And the maroon ones, yun yung website. So when they're connected, that means the Facebook page shares that website. But anyway, I don't want to go into the technicalities of it, but just to prove to you how massive this is. And hindi lang ito yon, I'm sure. Marami pang iba dyan. And once you take one down, madali lang yan umusbong ulit. And I've actually talked to several staff, former staff of Twinmark, and they're confident that even if Facebook takes us down, it's so easy for us to game the system under, right under Facebook's nose. So yun ang problema. And if this doesn't bother you, I mean, you should you should start. It should actually bother you and start to question your your user habits, user habits, sa uh, Facebook, Twitter. Because uh, you should get out of your newsfeed. 
kasi it's curated for you, dapat you go out of that and go directly to the websites. Kasi doon, it's the unfiltered, so to speak, version of the of what's happening around you. Hindi lang yung kung ano ibibigay sa yun ng Facebook. And also, that's one way to counter the algorithm because if Facebook sees that you're going to other to to other websites, they also adjust it. But the point is really go out of your Facebook news feed to get information and read as much as possible. Lang lahat like. Not just ABS, not just Rappler, not just Philstar. Read a lot. That's one way to battle this. So come 2022, this is already a reality. Digital operations is already a must for candidates and political strategists. And more is at stake because in 2022, we will have a new leader. We will also be electing uh, 12 new national leaders in the Senate. So we're expecting now with the uh, developments na parang developments of technology and sa platforms, they'll be able to, to game the system easier. So mas mahirap for us. So as early as now, we really have to prepare for this kasi on top of the local networks that we have, uh, meron din tayong na monitor na, na foreign interference like from China and all that. So it's really, no. again, no single person and group can do this. It really has to be all of us. And with more intimate and closed ways to engage with their audiences, mas nagiging sinister sila and it's really harder to spot them. But now that you know what they're doing, at least on the basic level, you can go deeper on your own. Pag may nakita kayo on your feed or anywhere online, you can, alam mo yun, you can just go for, you can go further than what they tell you and parang somehow think about what's the technicality behind this. So it's a, I mean, what I told you, those are like the sad realities, harsh realities, but of course there's still, always, always there's still hope. So how do we change this? I know it's, it's been said so many times, but really awareness and education is key, especially different levels of awareness. Like, it's okay. It's really good. Like, ako ang dami ko natutunan sa sinabi ni Francis about the psychological aspect of it because that's not my line. So it, may, it made me realize more what really draws people into that. So now you're aware somehow of the technical side of this information, but maybe soon with all these kinds of webinars, mas marami pa tayong malaman. Next is structural changes, which I'll touch on later. So basically, it, ang ibig sabihin ito, these platforms really have to start within themselves, like concrete changes in the way they run their businesses. And next is a human rights-centered approach because, um, as I said, Facebook, social media, when you combine all of them, uh, tens of billions of users, and it's like a whole world of its own. And parang dapat sinasabi ng mga critics of big tech or of tech companies that they should follow the international human rights law because for example in the in Facebook marami ng uh, it in, in like several posts inside crime hate just recently with uh, US president Donald Trump i know you're familiar with what happened but Facebook and Twitter uh, permanently or Facebook permanently banned him and for Twitter they I, I think they also did the same thing but the point is it's good that they took it down but did we have to wait for this long for them to do something like that because every time you're pushing the edge of the human rights parang kung every time you test mo kung hanggang saan lumala na. that's what happened um, just a few days ago next um, yeah. So uh, an international group called Forum on Information and Democracy uh, proposed actually a hundred concrete proposals for tech companies, but I don't want to drown you with that. So next slide. So basically they're pushing for uh, necessary solutions to so four things. Platform transparency, Ito yung dapat ang mga platforms, they should tell us how their algorithms work. And every time I change the algorithm, they inform us 
they inform news agencies, they inform, basically they should inform its users. They should also inform the public about um, changes, some about advertisers, kung sino yung mga advertisers nila, things like that. Next is sa content moderation. Kasi um, ang laki-laki ng Facebook and they really cannot identify kung sino yung mga fake, kung sino yung mga misleading and all that. They're now relying mostly on fact checkers like Verifiles and Rappler and many others worldwide. But the thing is, you're earning so much from, from the business. So might as well invest a lot of money and a lot of people on content moderation. Actually, they also have content moderators, but for Twitter and Facebook, it, there's a different issue altogether. It's, um, it's a labor issue. So, dapat ayusin nila yon and invest more on culturally expert content reviewers because what may be considered uh, parang inciting to hate or, or crime in, let's say, in the U.S., hindi siya necessarily ganun sa Pakistan, sa Saudi Arabia, or other Middle Eastern countries, and same in the Philippines. So, dapat meron din culture experts doon. Hindi lang yung, yung mindset ay West. It shouldn't be like that. And next is promotion of reliable news and information. Uh, ito yung dun sa algorithm nila. They should prioritize yung over-engagement. They should prioritize yung mga uh, legitimate information and all that. And next is private messaging services. This is actually a growing trend now. Medyo hindi pa, hindi pa na pag-aaralan masyado in the Philippines. But um, it's this information really spreads fast in, like for example, Viber, WeChat. So ang ginawa, to be fair to, we, uh, to WhatsApp, they, parang, they, they made a label para people know if the message they received is forwarded so they can they could they could question the veracity or accuracy of that but still they need to what what these platforms need to do is to increase the friction so to simplify it yung parang ba, hindi mapadali yung sharing in general of information para hindi rin madali yung pag spread ng false news like for example yung nabanggit kanina ni Francis about Twitter like do you want to maybe you want to read the article first. Tapos yung dun din sa private messaging services, I think they placed a limit na 10 times ka lang pwedeng mag-forward ng isang message. So, things like that. And I'm I tried to to summarize all the information because I know how technical this can get, but I really hope you learned so I you learned a lot from my presentation and it's really really my hope and prayer that for 20 in preparation for 2022 will be smarter voters and will be more you know critical users of social media that's all thank you thank you very much Camille for that presentation on the tech side of things um, so for this afternoon's webinar we were able to uh, get a picture of how we're supposed to deal with this information using um, our knowledge on our psychological vulnerabilities. And at the same time, how do we deal with fake news, especially since all of us are on Facebook, all of us are on Twitter and social media, no? Ano ba yung mga vulnerabilities natin pagdating sa mga ganyang platforms? And siguro, dugtong ako lang yung sinabi na Camille, of course, we're, we're hoping that by 2022, people are smarter, people are more critical. But I hope we also um, see a lot of progress when it comes to um the changes in the platforms um as shared by camille no meron ng mga groups international organizations that are really working um towards that na magkaroon ng mga changes magkaroon ng mga um platform revisions para yung mga um, vulnerabilities natin pagdating dito sa um pagdating dito sa spread of disinformation ay medyo mabawasan no? I'm sure a lot of you have questions for Miss Camille and also still for um, Sir Francis. For now, um, let's have a quick um, commercial. I'm going to first uh, show you a video from the SML project. This is a 
digital media literacy campaign project from Xavier University. And I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from what they've done for the past couple of years, um, trying to uh, educate and build the media literacy skills of um, uh, people in Cagayan de Oro. Let's watch this. With an average screen time of 10 hours and 2 minutes, the Philippines is the top internet user in the world. That is based on the digital 2019 report of social media management firm Hootsuite and creative agency We Are Social dethroning the thighs as the heaviest internet users. As of 2020, people in the Philippines topped the daily usage charts, spending an average of 9 hours and 45 minutes. According to research, the South Asian countries are the most addicted internet users in the world, with the Philippines topping the global list. Among social media users in the Philippines, Facebook was the most used platform, while Google and YouTube are once again the most visited websites. With the popularization of the online world, cyberbullying and misinformation remains prevalent in the Philippines. According to the United Nations Children's Fund or UNICEF, the latest national data in the Philippines shows that cyberbullying or cyberviolence affects almost half of children aged 13 to 17. The prevalence of cyber violence for males, 44%, is almost the same for females with 43%. Filipino children are experiencing cyber violence in the form of verbal abuse over the internet or mobile phones, while others are through sexual messages. The hashtag The Asimo Project is a campaign created by the Exu Development Communication Society with the help of their moderator, Rachel Antolinero Baracias, that aims to educate social media users, particularly the senior high students, on how to counter hate speech, how to spot and stop fake news, and promote responsible journalism online. The launching of the said project took place at the Devcom Theater Lab last July 21, 2018. The XU Development Communication Society has partnered with the XU Senior High School Student Paper, the Squire Publication, and the SHS Student Government. They have successfully launched the hashtag the SML project with an opening theme, hashtag SML, the social media literacy project, hashtag Tunaynibesh. The campaign's initial objectives were to counter hate speech online, promote responsible citizen journalism among SHS students, and drive awareness on social media consumerism and production. The campaign's initial goal was informing people of the do's and don'ts when interacting online, creating content like the 10 social media commandments, shield yourself from hate speech, and the SML board game, which features the different personalities we acquire both good and bad when interacting online. The campaign launched two legs since the time it was created, Operation Heart Attack in 2018 and the hashtag you denote cyberbully in 2019. Operation Heart Attack, the first leg of the campaign focuses on shifting the way to counter hate speech against Visayas and changing the narrative portrayed by Visayas. The campaign launched both online and offline activities targeting SHS students and MIL teachers. Online activities including engaging online users in a positive discourse and conducting Operation Heart Attack on hate speech against Visayas. For offline activities, the campaign conducted class trips to four partner schools and conducted a seminar workshop for MIL teachers. 
the second leg of the campaign hashtag you know cyberbully emphasizes on halting the victim blaming culture through creating safe spaces online, countering cancel culture, and sharing a culture of positivity when interacting online. The second leg conducted a webinar series on what it means to be digitally literate and how to be responsible digital citizens online in partnership with Facebook Philippines and Mano Amiga. Driven towards increased digital literacy and the reinforcement of positive and responsible behavior online, the hashtag Asimil project joined Facebook's peer-to-peer -peer challenge and the Digital Youth Summit PH in 2018 and 2019. The Digital Youth Summit is a two-day action-oriented conference for youth leaders, social innovators, and community developers. In the two years Hashtag Asimo joined the summit, the project was awarded as the back-to-back -back digital ambassadors. The Hashtag Asimo project also participated in Facebook Philippines Digital Tayo campaign and Facebook's Community Boost in 2019. Facebook's Community Boost is a global initiative that aims to equip different sectors of society with the necessary tools and resources they need to develop critical skills in entrepreneurship, advocacy promotion, and reaching their audiences. And just last year, the campaign was featured on an episode of Youth for Truth in commemorating the Cybersecurity Awareness Month. The hashtag Asimil project currently has 18,351 likes on Facebook and has reached up to 90,000 people. All right. Um, again, once again, that's a video presentation from the SML project from Xavier University DevCom students or DevCom Society. Um, at this point, I would like to call in again our two speakers, Sir Simon Bryce and Ms. Camila Elenia, for uh, some questions from our participants. Perfect. Okay. Um, there's a question here from Facebook uh, from user Ms. Susie Mayroa. According to her, uh, maybe she just wants to get a tip from our speakers. What is the best way to um, tell a person who you believe lacks the cognitive skills, the cognitive evaluative skills? Uh, what's the best way to explain to them or let them understand that what they are sharing online is not factual? Maybe without hurting them or without um, offending them. Ano ba yung tip na meron kayo, Sir Francis? Anyone? Okay, I go first. Usually kasi like based on my experience, what I do is, it depends kasi if you know the person talaga, like dinederecho ko, pero alam mo yung blunt but very respectful, like, I just tell them, hey, Tito, example. Hey, Tito, I think what you shared was parang already proven otherwise. Parang was already parang debunk. Ito po yun. Pero parang, alam mo yun, idadaw, parang the impact on him, you also, tr at first, you also try to massage his ego. Ganun yung sa practical side of it. If you really know the person, like, if you know how to massage his ego. Na, hi Tito, I, I think what you shared is interesting, pero it's wrong po. Ito po yung, tapos the link. It was already corrected. Next time na lang po, you just stop sharing from that um, Facebook page because baka isipin po nung ibang tao you're sharing wrong information. Parang ganun. Ganun na parang pabebe. Para... <laughs> Pabebe. Hindi hindi uh, hindi ka alam mo yon hindi yung you don't kasi parang like sabi nga ni Francis kanina parang wag kang mayabang in that sense para aminin mo na you're not also knowledgeable about everything so ganun na lang para yun kasi yung napapansin ko na number one problem na sabi nila you think you know everything it's right para ganun 
Tama, tama. Um, Sir Francis, anything you want to add to that? Actually, I like Camille's answer kasi yun para, ganun talaga siya. You don't just say na pa, fake news ka naman eh. Because the moment that na sinabi mo na fake news ka, hindi ka naman di na siya makikinig. So, I would think it also depends tama na how well do you know the person. Pwede mas madaling kausapin yung tao kapag hindi ganun ka politically charged yung issue. For example, teching kanin, that's easily resolvable. Just send a message, be respectful, be tactful, it will be easily solved. Siguro ang mas concern ng question is, paano kaya pag mas politically motivated yung nature ng post, yun talaga maghanda sa mas mahaba-habang diskusyon. So again, same principles of um, if you know the person, of, of tactful and compassionate conversation. Pero kung mga smaller things naman, mga simple debunking na ay na-prove na yun false, I think it would be sufficient. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, there's another question here from Mr. Gerard Lopez. According to him, Um, does using the same techniques used by fake news peddlers help reach out misinformed sectors? Like if we use catchy, simple articles, same strategies of audience engagement, or even maybe micro-targeting. If we make use of these uh, techniques, kaya ba natin ma-reach yung mga misinformed sectors or individuals? I think in a way, yes, but I'm not sure about micro-targeting because you need a lot of money for that too. And honestly, yung itong mga fake news peddlers, parang ahead na sila of the game. That's why yung na-mention ni Francis kanina, it's so hard to fact check because it feel you feel like like us as journalists, we feel like we're running all over the place trying to to fact check everything. Tapos bago na namang um, spread of lies, minsan coming from the officials themselves. So sometimes... Yun yung mahirap. So I think really, so ang ginawa namin at Rappler, so we have regular fact checks, but at the same time, we produce parang taglish videos para mas madaling panoorin. I think just a minute or two para anytime. So yun, yun yung ginawa namin way to address that. Pero in terms of micro-targeting, I don't think, gonna, I don't think honestly, like for Rappler now, at the middle of yung attack sa amin, I don't think we can afford to do that. So what we constantly do is webinars and things like this. Sir Simon? On my on my end, I'm thinking that makakatulong sana siya because fake news, as Camille said, relies on the ability of these algorithms and these tech companies to propagate information almost automatically. Ang problem at a psychological level is you're going against these fundamental heuristics that we have. Ang strategy ng fake news is to divide, to disinform, to confuse. Mas madaling gawin yun kaysa to inform, to unite, saka to integrate people. So we're fighting two battles at the same time. Our psychological behavior at the same time, our technological and cultural values. So it will be a difficult task. And as we have said repetitively across this entire webinar, the solution is something that you would have to do together, simultaneously. But yet, yet the same strategies could apply, but we have to find a way to use it to our benefit. Para at least makahabol naman yung katotohanan to some yeah. extent. I agree with that. Kasi para okay, fine, this is our reality now. But while that is the case, I still believe that it's good that, for example, in Europe and in the US, they're running after these tech companies to, you know, to regulate them or somehow make them accountable. But every time... Nangyayari yon. I still come to the realization. Mangyayari din ba yon sa Philippines? I mean, understandable. In Europe and in US, malaking market nila yon. Those are big countries. I mean, diba? Those are big markets. Pero what about us in the Philippines? Mangyayari din kaya yon. So that's really the challenge. It's, I think really, us as individual users, we can say what we want to say about Facebook. Kasi sometimes... Yun na lang yun eh. Nakikinig na lang sila sa user base nila. But like dapat it has to be like, alam mo yun, concerted effort to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, pretty much, no? Same yung message na sabi nga ni Camille kanina, we're all in this together. Na on all fronts, dapat ay um, sinusubukan natin gumawa ng mga solutions. There's no single um, initiative, no single approach to solving the problem. And definitely, kailangan natin sabay-sabay na uh, 
to touch on, try to uh, do our own um, efforts no, para nga ma-counter yung disinformation. So since we're running out of time, maybe I can just ask uh, Ms. Camille and Sir Francis to maybe just one last uh, message to our participants for today's webinar, especially for our participants who are actually joining the EWAS Fake Digital Campaign Challenge. If they're going to design a campaign, a digital campaign countering this information, any quick tips or ideas that you might want to share with them? Who wants to go first? Sir Francis? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, siguro, the best advice I could give is one of my favorite um, ideas in psychology is actually what you call political efficacy. Political efficacy is the belief that we can do something about a particular issue. I think kasi, one of the problems that somehow I feel about current fact checking approaches is we emphasize too much the facts. We're neglecting the fact that we are very emotional and social people. I think one of the ways by which we can also develop a more effective media literacy campaign is by making people feel that this is something that has an impact, whatever the effect or whatever the scope it may have. So I hope that whoever participates in your campaign, sana matakal niyo din yung aspect ito that efficacy, that hope is possible, despite our democracy not being in the best condition. Because the only reason why the truth and our lib civil rights will have any impact is because we have the hope that it will have some type of effect. So at the end of the day, we have to frame it in a way that makes people feel that we can do something about it. I know it's a dark that we talked about in this entire session, but Hope is the best weapon that we have in the very dark times in which we live. I don't know if this is really possible, but sometimes I think it's possible. So maybe, yeah, it is somehow. So I think if they can devise a, a plan or something to, well, at the same time, fighting this information, parang calling out, parang there's a way to also call, parang, kasi diba I said, Facebook or Twitter will listen to its user base if they're alam yon, concerted effort. So if there's a way to do that in a plan somehow, like in the Philippines, yeah, we could. Because like for us journalists, when we ask questions to Facebook, of course they reply to us. Pero even to us, hindi taga complete yung replies nila. Like they still hide some things na it should be transparent. So if it comes from the public, somehow to that effect, they might be pushed to do something. Kasi pag sasabi nila, oh, it's journalist na naman, para ang daling i-dismiss na, kayo lang naman yung obsessed over finding out about these details. But when it comes from the people, na dahil nga, hopefully dahil medyo alam nyo na yung technical side of it, na you have to demand accountability. Parang fighting this information at the same time, somehow demanding accountability from Facebook. They have an office in the Philippines, so... Baka pwede magkasama yun. Correct, no? Magkasama yan. So, according to Sir Francis, hope, hope things, things uh, will change. Even the littlest efforts that we might have, there's still hope to change things. And according to Ms. Camille, um, there needs to be more effort for us to uh, push back and demand accountability, transparency from our social media platforms. So, for now, we will say bye and YouTube. Thank you to Ms. Camille and Sir Francis for gracing our webinar today. I'm sure everyone learned a lot from our session. And if you do have more questions for our speakers, I'm sure you can contact them. And um, Sir Francis sent a link if you would want to access his presentation and also other readings that are relevant to the topics that we discussed today. You can definitely visit that. So again, thank you very much, Ms. Camille and Sir Francis on behalf of OOTB and our uh, participants. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So to our um, participants, just give me a few more minutes. I will be sharing one more video, this time from the Initiative for Media Freedom, who will be sharing with us their efforts in uh, battling this information in the country today. And then to wrap up our webinar today, I will be just giving you a rundown of the important dates that you have to take note of um, in our digital campaign challenge program. So let's watch this uh, presentation from Greg Kehelia, the um, chief of party in the Internews Philippines. 
Hello everyone, I am Greg Kiaia. I am the country representative of the NGO Internews in the Philippines. Marlon, the co-founder of the Out of the Box Media Literacy Initiative, has asked me if I could share with you today some information about the work of Internews in the Philippines. So I'd like to say a few words via this recorded message on the Initiative for Media Freedom, which is the main program implemented by Internews here in the Philippines with the support of USAID. Uh, the Initiative for Media Freedom is a five-year program which started in 2019 and is implemented with a large array of national partners. And most of them you are most likely familiar with. We work, of course, with the University of the Philippines, uh, with the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism, PCIJ, with Verifies, with Rappler, with the Foundation for Media Alternative, with Engage Media, with PecoJohn, with Life Solution, as well as uh, with the National Union of Journalists of the Philippines, NUJP. Uh, we also have one international partners, partner, which is Rewi Corporation, a firm based in Canada, which help us with a mass online survey to better understand the expectation of Filipinos regarding their information ecosystem. Uh, the program is essentially implementing 25 clusters of activities structured along three objectives. The first objective is dedica dedicated to enabling environment for free press in the Philippines with a strong focus on journalist safety. Why journalist safety? Well, Philippine media have been repeatedly, consistently demonstrating their courage, their dedication, their resilience, their commitment to bring to Filipinos verified trustworthy information for decades. Uh, since the martial law to date, um, the commitment of Philippine media is impeccable. Uh, in the meantime, unfortunately, the Philippines have also been consistently ranking among the five worst countries in the world when it comes to safety of journalists. Online harassment, legal harassment, threats, red tagging, violence and sometimes killings are part of the reality of Filipino journalists and media. And it was therefore essential for Inter News as an NGO dedicated to the media sector to have an entire objective around the question of safety of journalists in the Philippines. The second objective of the program is about the critical issue of disinformation and notably online disinformation. Um, it is not an excessive statement to say that online disinformation spread notably through social media platforms uh, has become one of the main threats to democratic systems around the world in the past years. And this is true everywhere, and this is of course very true for the Philippine democracy, which has proven um, extremely targeted by influence operations and disinformation for many years. Uh, referring to 2016 elections, a Facebook executive said in 2019 that this is where Facebook realized that Philippines were the patient zero of online disinformation. Tackling disinformation requires various types of engagement, and I will not go into details today, but we try to work both on supply and demand of disinformation. Working on supply means working on identifying violent actors and toxic operations, and coordinating with social media platforms to make sure that the spread of influence operations and disinformation operations is limited, uh, that malign actors are taken down. Uh, but it's also important to work on the demand of disinformation, on the citizenry, of citizen understanding of the importance of verified, trustworthy information. And as I mentioned, there is a third objective uh, related to the self-regulation of the media sector. Self-regulation is important in so many ways, um, but the main one, in my view, is that it is a viable alternative to a strictly legalistic approach of combating disinformation um, and promoting ethical standards uh, among journalists and in the media community. Um, an all legalistic approach is often dangerous, as we see in many countries around the world, because creating new laws to combat fake news or disinformation 
or to promote uh, ethical behaviors in the media sector, very often bear the risk uh, to give space to governments for censorship. Therefore, from Internews' perspective, the self-regulation of the media sector is a viable alternative um, to tackling by laws and by laws only uh, the issues we have mentioned. And there are some very interesting models in the Philippines. If you look, for example, at the Cebu Citizen Press Council, uh, this is an extremely interesting local mechanism enabling the local communities uh, to engage with their local media and dialogue about the critical issues they would like to see their media covering. This is a model we find actually so interesting that we're working with one of our partners, Peko John, to see if it can be replicated uh, in other areas of the country. So yes, this is in brief what I wanted to tell you today about the Initiative for Media Freedom. But to finish, maybe one last point. Um, we strongly believe that none of the work I have been referring to will be possible or at the very least will be sustainable without a strong involvement of the, young, the, youth, the youth sector. The organizations you are representing have therefore, in our view, a key role to play in protecting and promoting this healthy information ecosystem in the Philippines. And we therefore see you as natural allies to the work we are doing. And we hope you will see us in 10 years as natural allies to the work you are doing. So I look forward to an opportunity to meeting you in person and wish you a wonderful event today. Thank you. So once again, that's um, Greg Kehelia. He's the country representative of Internews working on the Initiative for Media Freedom Project. Um, if you're familiar with their partner organizations, you can see their Rappler and Verifiles uh, and UJP. And of course, uh, you saw earlier um, one of the cartoons, the comic strip um, made by Tarantadong Calpo, which is in partnership with Foundation for Media Alternatives, which is part of this internews project. So um, to wrap up our webinar for today, I want to start with thanking everyone who helped us mount this project, starting off with our speakers, Sir Simon Bryce and Ms. Camille Alemia for enlightening our participants and me likewise everyone from OOTV learned uh, new things today particularly on these many other elements that we have to concern ourselves with when it comes to the problem of disinformation also i would like to thank um sml project tamarao and initiative for media freedom for um, giving us those recorded videos um, and i'm sure our participants are inspired by all of these work that you are doing in your own communities in order to help out in uh, battling disinformation. And of course, I won't be forgetting all of our participants, those of you who attended today's uh, webinar. Uh, thank you very much for, again, spending this afternoon with us, choosing to start your new year 2021 with this commitment to challenge and counter disinformation. I hope many of you have already registered, or if you haven't registered yet, you still have five days to form your teams and um, get yourselves registered in the Digital Campaign Challenge. So before we let you go, let me just go through quickly the dates that you have to take note of for our EWAS Fake Challenge. On January 14 will be the last day for registration. And then next week, Saturday, it's going to be uh, workshop. We're going to have a workshop on designing digital campaigns. This time, this will be exclusive to the participants of the digital campaign challenge. Again, uh, as for the mechanics, just go to ootbmedialiteracy.org slash ewasfake slash challenge. We're looking for teams of three to seven members, ages 14 to 21. 14 to 21. Um, ideally, we're looking for members of Campus Press, youth organizations, student governments, but you can still participate in this event even if you don't have any common affiliation. All we need is your commitment to defeating this information. Um, and then from January 16 to January 31, 
the teams are expected to work on their campaign strategy plan, which they will be submitting on the 31st of January. And then come next month, for the whole month of February, this is the main meat of the, pro the program, the three-week campaign implementation. So Feb 1 to 28 is four weeks. That means the participants are only going to choose three weeks for this entire month that they will be mounting their campaign. And then, of course, the campaign will have to be documented and submitted to us by March 5. And then uh, March 7 to 13 will be the judging of entries. And then by March 17, we get to announce the winners of our campaign. So um, that's it for our webinar today. I'm hoping that all of you can, um, all of you learned something new today and you can invite your friends invite your students your teachers to participate in the ewas fake digital campaign challenge and i hope to see many of you or all of you again next week for the workshop on designing digital campaign campaigns this has been marlon obrado uh, in behalf of out of the box media literacy initiative happy new year everyone and good afternoon